Hey everyone, Norm from Tested here, and I'm so delighted to be in the workshop of Mark Satrakian. Mark, thank you so much for having us here. Thanks for coming. It's yeah. really good to see you again, Norm. So good to see you in this crazy year, crazy time. Yes. Uh, and you have been making robots for so long, but we thought it'd be a great chance to come visit your shop for the first time, to take a look at some of your old projects and just kind of dive into the world of animatronics and robot design. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you for coming. Uh, and you know, we've got, I've got this robot here to show you. This is Axis, and Axis is a robotic art piece that I built in 2012. And the story with Axis is that one of my colleagues, Chet Zar, who is an amazing artist himself, he's an incredible creature effects artist, but he's also uh, a fine artist, and he curates a show, an art show, a group show, and he invited me to create a piece for the show. And I had never really made something just for myself before in that way. I've done you know, basically commercial art for my whole career. So I made a thing called Cascade, which is like a tentacle. And there are a few recurring themes in my work. One of them is tentacles, and another one is mechanical hands. So when it came time to do a sequel to Cascade, the idea that I thought of right away was something that was based on a hand, a mechanical hand. And that's what this is. It's very specifically a, a sort of sinister looking hand with four fingers and a thumb, and it's very gently and delicately spinning this globe. And the thing that I really did not know how I was gonna pull off on this was the motion, the, the kinematics of how do you make something like this work with a ball. And, but I thought I could probably figure it out, and I did, <laughs> and this is the result. The movement is so fluid, and the fact that you went for a hand, which is something that you know, we as humans, we, we would know there's uncanny valley if it doesn't move yeah. naturally. That seems like a, an ambitious challenge, but obviously you have years and years and decades of experience working and creating in robots and animatronics for the special effects industry. Uh, this is directly interacting with a real object. It's balancing yes. this globe. So can you break down what each finger is doing, how it's constructed and what that animation is? Sure, absolutely. So. The fingers, well, first of all, the fingers are all the same. They're all the same size, they're all the same length, which helps a little bit. The other thing that I did was just to start thinking about this, I came up with some limitations. And the first was, okay, I'm gonna define a plane, and that's the base of the fingers. I'm gonna define another plane, that's the plane that the fingers are touching the ball. Okay, so I've got that. And then I called upon high school trigonometry. Mm. And I started figuring out the, the angles. These, it's just a bunch of triangles. So. There's one triangle that describes the finger tilting on this, this, this axis like this. There's another triangle that determines where this point is in space based on its height. And then finally, there's a triangle that determines what the angles of these two joints are for, to put that point where I need it. And once I had that, I was able to define a path in space and have these fingers walk along that path. And when I use the word walk, it's because it's basically a walking machine. Right, it has, a, it has a walking gait. It's a pentapod. It's a five-legged spider lying on its back, spinning a ball like a circus animal. And that trigonometry, what you solve for is a way to send instructions based on this design, how many joints, the distance between right. the joints, so that you know where that tip of that finger is at right. all times, and then you can program an animation. Now right. is this- we, like call a, it, we call it inverse kinematics. Right, So okay. that's, the, that's the familiar phrase. In this case, I'm using trigonometry to determine the inverse kinematics because luckily the fingers are reasonably simple. Mm. Um, I'm still learning, I'm starting to learn a little bit about uh, linear algebra and some of the, the much more complex ways of de determining inverse kinematics, but this was kind of my baby steps into that field. And uh, I, I have to say that's one of the reasons why I do these projects is to really stretch and learn and grow as, a, as an artist and as a, as an engineer is because um, I'm, I'm mostly self-taught is I'm, I'm constantly trying to come up with these challenges for myself to extend my work into other areas. Another thing I'll say is that I don't generally have time to figure out stuff like this on official projects. So if a movie comes along, the schedule is usually pretty short and there isn't a lot of time to experiment with inverse kinematics. So I'd really do that on my own time. And the benefit is that once I figure this out, I can apply this to another project in the future. Um, I don't know when I'm gonna do a walking pentapod, but you never know, it might come in handy. Well, in terms of the world of pentapods, you didn't just build access. It seems like 
you, know, you built this, it does this very specific task, but yeah. then you iterate, you made a next that's, generation. That's exactly right. And what happened there was that I got a call from our friends at BattleBots and they had seen Axis and they said, hey, can we use it in the show? We wanna put the trophy on it. And I told them that it was gonna be too heavy. So I made Axis 2. Ah. And Axis 2 has a couple of really key differences from Axis 1. The main difference is that it can handle a lot of weight. It can handle much more weight than, than Axis 1 could. Uh, the servos are beefier. The layout is more optimized for uh, the physical strength. The fingers are short and stout. And the other thing that it has is it has optical stabilization. There's a camera in the center of the palm pointing straight up that is right now looking at a black dot in the center of this paper. And if I push this around, the fingers will actually walk and pull that dot towards the center. So this is how I'm able to put this really heavy trophy, the BattleBots trophy on this, and have it spin for hours at a time and not fall off because it's actively centering the turntable. And that's a much more ambitious challenge in holding something like a globe here. It, it is. In terms and, of balance. And yeah, exactly right. Because with uh, Axis One, it's statically stable. The ball just naturally sits on the, mm. the points of the fingers. It's like sitting on a tripod. With this, because this is a, is a flat surface, anything could happen. This could, this could slide over, and it just did, and now it's going to pull it back again. And if you want to see how it works, I've got a screen over here yeah. that shows. So it's computer vision. It's, com it's computer vision, yes. You're taking exactly. an off-the-shelf kind of webcam. And exactly. So this is a, uh, it's a webcam in the palm of the hand looking straight up, and here you can see a little tiny dot and then here, this is the area that I've zoomed in on, mm -hmm. and there's my dot. And then down here, the circle indicates that it's seeing the spot and it's focusing on it. And it's actually determining two numbers. One number is how far away is it from the center, and the other is what's the angle. So it's, I call it heading and amplitude. So the heading is this way and the amplitude is whatever it is. And then based on that, it will actually extend the legs towards that and pull mm. it towards center. Because it's a, it's a pre-calibrated system in the sense that the dot you know yeah. is the center of gravity for this yes. splatter, this object. That's uh, even though the servos are the kind of advanced servos that have feedback. Yeah, right. But the feedback is, what that's doing is it's um, making sure that it goes where I'm telling it to go. Mm. But I have to tell it where to go. Right. And in order to do that, I have to know this information. The other thing that's interesting about this is that it works two ways, meaning that I can go around the system and I can actually drive it. So it is possible to take Axis 2 and turn it over and drive it around like a walking machine because that same direction and heading, it, it works both ways. It works upside down and it works right side up. Right, right, and you've designed it so it is on a plane. It is on a plane, yeah. Although what I'd like to do in the future is get it to the point where it could basically handle any irregular object. Mm -hmm. But for that, I'm gonna have to have force sensing exactly. on the fingertips, exactly. and that's kind of the next the next big step for me. I'm noticing on your interface here, you have two waves here. Yeah. What, are, what do those represent? So this is a, a window into the gate generator, and the gate generator is the thing that's basically making the thing take steps. So let me see, I've got a leg here somewhere. Oh, right. there it is. So with a leg like this, there are two things that are happening. One is that the, the, and I'll hold it like it's touching the globe, one is that it steps off the globe, and that's what's happening here. Every time you see this pop up, the leg is coming away from the surface and then coming back down again. And when it does that, it's advancing, 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 and then it hits that moment and it retracts and it comes around. So this is a step that has been deconstructed down to its simplest elements. The foot comes off the ground, the foot comes back down again. The foot takes a step forward and then the foot takes a step back. Those two things in combination are the, the primary building blocks of this simple gate generator. And then I multiply that by five and I change their phase relationship mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, it's basically a synthesizer. And this is a recurring theme in my work now. It's like a music synthesizer, but it synthesizes motion. And each of, and you're, so you're layering these waveforms to create the, the song of its movement, <laughs> yeah. essentially. Yeah, exactly. Which is the way you can think about, you know, when we walk as, as humans, walking is a very complex thing. For us, yeah. it's simple because it's built into our lizard brain. Yeah, yeah. But you're deconstructing it into very discrete waveforms. And then each waveform isn't just one axis of movement, it is one 
range of motion. Yes, yes, that's right. And it could be several, well, in the case of uh, the step, these, all of these servos have to work in, in coordination for that mm. to occur, which is why we do the inverse kinematics. All I care about is where the tip of this leg is. What these motors have to do to put that leg some po someplace in space, I don't want to have to worry about that. I just want to control the, the business end of this leg, and these motors have to follow along. Yeah. So that's another thing that's really important about being able to write these control systems. Is you really take ownership of what's happening at a much lower level than, than really I have in the past. And when it's in this waveform format, it's more manipulable than if it was a sequence of keyframes. Or... Oh yeah, absolutely. The other thing is that since it's algorithmic, I have, um, like you just said, I have a, a different kind of control over it than I would if I was drawing it in an animation package because mm -hmm. it's happening in real time. Right. So my, my puppeteering controls, if you will, are things like um, speed, amplitude, phase offset, uh, and these sound a little abstract, but from a puppeteering standpoint, if I'm controlling something um, like, uh, let's say, the scrunt in a M. Night Shyamalan's um, Lady in the Water, the way I'm controlling it, I'm not, again, I'm not worried about what the individual axes have to do. I'm worried about the performance. And so I have a whole different high-level set of controls that allow me to basically manipulate this and make it go from walking which is where I'm 180 degrees out of phase, yeah. to starting to gallop, where the yeah. phase angle changes, right? So I have this one control that makes a big difference in how you perceive the motion. Yeah, yeah. those are the dials and the, the numbers, the sliders that you can yeah. adjust. But can right. you also integrate direct puppeteering? Yes, yes, I can. That's the cool thing. You used the word layering a second ago, and that's actually a really good analogy. So I have direct control over some of the parameters we were talking about, like, this is that step length, and this right. is the, the height. And so I can combine the algorithmic control of like a running cycle, something really complicated that would be really, really difficult to puppeteer, and lay on top of that an expressive control that allows me to add the, you know, what's important for the scene from an emotional standpoint without having to worry about all the, the technical stuff that's happening under the surface. And then I can have those things happening simultaneously. So I can run the walking cycle Oh my gosh. And let's uh, speed this up a little bit. How about that? Wow. So it's, I'm controlling the physical location of the ball in space with an X, Y, Z control. It's like a little joystick, forward and back, left and right, up and down. And at the same time, the fingers are spinning the ball. It's, it's almost like the subconscious balancing that we would do right. in our normal gait or manipulation right. of objects combined right. with the very conscious then expressive right. manipulation of it. Right. It's kind of magical, honestly, just watching it happen. Wow, that is so cool. And these principles are things that apply not only to Axis, but for the other robots that you've built? Absolutely. I mean, this, this type of thing applies directly to, I mean, projects I'm working on right now, movies that are in production that I can't even talk about, but that allow me to have things like, um, like uh, you know, breathing and physical agitation and all the stuff that, mm -hmm. that it's like, oh, well, let's bring the puppet to life. Well, I can bring the puppet to life in a way that's, that's more compelling than I've ever been able to before now, and then do emotional puppeteering on top of that. Yeah. So that's, it's really powerful. Or even for a, a lay person to manipulate if they're controlling you know, a robot oh, for a TV show or that's, something. Yeah, exactly. So, Let's, let's talk about this thing for a second, yikes. So this, this is, uh, this is Hades. Hades is a prototype robot from the Robot Combat League TV show. And this is also a walking robot. So Axis over here is a pentapod, it's got five legs. Hades is a biped. The walking system for Hades is almost exactly the same, except the number of legs is two mm -hmm. instead of five. And the system that controls the algorithm, the walking algorithm, is uh, uh, unlike Axis, you have direct, direct control over the speed, you have direct control over the um, direction, right, the heading I was talking mm -hmm. about, and you also have direct control over the amplitude, which is how long the step is. So for something like Hades, the way the contestants would control the robots, they would steer it with basically a joystick, and then they had this other control that would allow them to change their, uh, the amplitude of the step and also make the robot crouch. Wow. So kind of like this control where I can bring it up and down. Yeah. They could do that, but with this robot. So imagine this robot going up and down, bobbing and weaving. 
The other thing that they could do, and this was a real surprise, was one of the contestants figured out that he could turn the speed down to zero and then just like crank on the amplitude and the robot would like snap into these, these fighting poses. It was really cool. It was also very unexpected. Yeah, and all of this is the combination of the algorithmic gate that you develop combined with then letting people Real manipulate the parameters of, yes. of that in a way that's relatable and also right. usable. That right. is super, super cool. I should cool. mention that the, the control system for Robot Combat League was a collaboration with Concept Overdrive. And the reason I did that was because they had everything to control hydraulic robots already figured out. But the thing that they didn't have was the walking algorithm. So we kind of had to figure that out together. Um, but luckily I'd already made robots similar to Axis, so we kind of knew what to do. And whether it's a robot that's hydraulically driven or with electric servos, yeah. it's all the same principles in terms of the motion, how you think about deconstructing the motions for animation for performance. Yes. It's decades of institutional knowledge, <laughs> and we'll include links and descriptions for all places where people can find out more information about your projects. Thank you so much for having us here, Mark. It's so Norm, great thanks, to see you. Thanks for coming.